Megan, for, for joining today. Um, I'm going to share my slides um, so everybody hopefully can see these. Um, and I'll keep them in this format if that's okay, just so I can see everybody, because I know we do get questions the odd time, so I can't see everything when they're in full, full share mode. Um, so for those of you who don't know, or people that haven't been on before, um, I'm Una Buckley. Um, I'm based down in Cork. Um, I know some of you from different parts of the county. Um, I run a diversity inclusion business um, for students with learning differences and challenges. And um, we've worked with Thankfully, a wide range of organisations and a wide range of establishments to date. Um, we mainly work with students on a one-to-one -one and a direct basis. Um, we do some group work as well, but very limiting. Um, but it's mainly on the intervention piece. So how can we help support them on a more of a regular basis and based upon their specific needs and challenges? So it's very, very individualistic, um, as I'm sure you're aware of. We've had teachers on in the past and we work with a lot of schools and institutions. You know, no two students in a classroom are the same. It's really, really important that some element of individuality applies to both, you know, a general well-being of education, but also then around today's topic around study and exam tips. Really, really important that that is very individualistic. So it's important to take that into account because what works for some students with learning off piece of information or producing things in exam environment won't work for everybody. Um, so a little bit of what we look at today um, is study, kind of a mix between study and exams and well-being. So what we will look at overall really is how we get ourselves in the best shape as possible or help somebody else get them in the best shape as possible to produce in an exam environment under quite you know strenuous and time intensive conditions and um, the well-being piece is really really important and um, so we'd address this regularly in in some other sessions and some other videos that I'm engaged in but that well-being and underlying piece is really really important to obviously produce in an exam setting so a student that isn't well themselves both mentally or physically obviously will find it very very difficult to produce their best work in an exam environment. So we have a range of kind of free booklets and prizes um, for this evening's workshop. Um, I'll put this link also in the chat, guys. Um, I'll also share it as well at the end. But I do have um, some booklets to go along with today's content. So feel, please feel free to um, fill out that if you get a chance. Um, I'll also send you a brief link to learn a little bit more about what we do guys i'll just mute everybody sorry um for those that know some people have been on before and um, so i'll send you a brief um link if anybody's interested in looking at one or two of our short videos and all the kids um okay so our four main pillars of success are the main things that we work with the students of all age groups is organization well-being studying and concentration OK, so there are four key pillars and key strands. Genuinely, this applies to all students and all age all age brackets and all age groups, whether they're young or you know, mature students or anything like that. And um, we need to have an element of organization and we need to have some element of well-being. Obviously, study strategies and supports and methodology around memory retention and then to be able to concentrate, you know, either in short bursts of time or over a long period of time. Some of our organisation tips. Now, some of these will be, I suppose, applied in a little bit of a different sense. Um, but obviously, lots of the content is geared towards students with a different way of learning. So be that dyslexia, dysgraphia, you know, autism, anything across the board. Um, it's a really important to tailor methods, as I was saying, so that it will suit the student or suit the child um, so that they can work in the best environment. The time management piece obviously is essential and I was as quick as I suppose the student can learn how best to manage their time and organise their time the better. Um, we, we would often find obviously when we work with you in primary school children learning the clock and all of those things can be very very challenging so as you can imagine a student that will have difficulty learning the clock or learning the time will then have difficulty obviously managing time in both their studying and in their exam environments if they don't cement that idea. So possible uses would be timers and um, we often do um, the, the, the sand, sand timers as well so that there isn't a noise if there's a sensory issue so something isn't going off in the background. Any kind of clever ways that can help judge time and can help manage the time um, and then the student can reflect upon okay how much they actually got written or how much they learned in that period of time and then what is possible between now and when they sit the exam for the amount of content that they need to learn. 
wall charts and diaries or this can be like wall diagrams or anything on whiteboard sheets so you know and there's lots of those um I won't say clink film sheets of paper, but um, sheets of paper now that can be, you know, stuck up on the wall and then can be taken down and, you know, washed and cleaned and whiteboard markers and everything else. So it doesn't have to be those standalone static things that take up a lot of space in people's houses. They can be very useful for, you know, judging time. They can also be used then obviously for going over content, doing bullet points, doing pictures, doing diagrams, and then using them even as like a vision board style. So printing off some of the content and putting them up in a visual representation. So if a student is learning about rivers or they're learning about, you know, maps or biology, you know, any visual representation on those can be really, really useful instead of looking down consistently and at a book. Visual planning methods. So the mind map heaps, we would have address, addressed this in, in previous workshops. Um, please feel free if anybody's unsure of, of still mind map methods. Um, we do do an online program about this as well, which I'll mention towards the end. Um, but a mind map piece is probably one of the most effective tools that will help students with different ways of learning to understand information and produce it in an exam environment. So generally speaking, as students move from kind of primary to secondary, um, there's still a, a vast volume increase of information and trying to, I suppose, store that information in different parts of your brain is where a lot of the skills come into it. So that visual representation in some form of a mind map, but having a sequential approach. So what I mean by that is and mind maps can't be done in a, you know, an ordinary way where you just throw all the information up and just put words, but it's scattered around. It needs to have a sequence and it needs to have an order. Um, so again, if people need more information on that, we can address that um, as we go through today's um, topic. Workload versus the time allocated to completing it. So I suppose this ties in with a lot of work that we do with students with homework and with regular day to day schoolwork activities. It's really important to manage what actually is being produced versus the time allocated to it. So if a student is sitting at a book trying to understand pieces of information for two or three hours, what is the benefit or the reward of actually doing that? Are they actually learning? Are they retaining in the information? And how long are they retaining it for? Is it for a few days? Is it for a long period of time? Is it, you know, so that they can say it to somebody else? What is the purpose of them understanding it and learning it? And how long can they, you know, transcend that information into their own brain? That is vital, obviously, as students, again, move from primary to secondary or even into third level when there's lots of different subjects or lots of different modules. And then obviously sequentially lots of different tests environments where they have to obviously try and coordinate what information needs to be delivered into which type of exam environment. So that time piece and managing time again falls in here as to how do we illustrate 45 minutes to do this chapter versus okay well this chapter is going to be a lot longer so we need to allocate more time to that so that delegation piece is very very important for the student to understand and learn how to manage as they get a little bit older and move through things now some of the well-being piece may sound very very basic um and most of them are um and to all of us really um is is some core i suppose foundations as to how we survive and exist um in this current world from a student basis, unfortunately, lots of these things aren't common sense um, or lots of things will be stepped over very, very quickly and very, very regularly. Um, we would work with an awful lot of leaving their students um, this year, probably more so than ever. And lots of them very, very highly functioning, know all of these things on paper, yet in their day to day or you were asked to map, the, map things out in a day to day time basis. Very few of them are getting in all of these things regularly um, or any at all. So it's really important that information is illustrated into action um, because time can pass and weeks can pass and months can pass in stressful environments where we don't integrate these things. We often try and implement some of these patterns as early as possible. Um, obviously, in the younger generation, quite easy to do most of these things, I'm sure, um, as they move into kind of early bits of secondary school and then towards junior search particularly then also in leaving search cycle, these get a little bit harder to, to implement for the student themselves if they don't have a willingness to, to want to do it. So 
we try and I suppose see it as how do we get again the most benefit out of our time and how does it then impact our level of reward and retention in an exam or in a school environment so some students that are very overworked and um, stressed strained you know we kind of do a little bit of a program with them depending upon where they're at with things as to how we can integrate some of these as small little blocks of time so then they can maintain a little bit more balance and um, obviously you don't need to go through any of these I'm sure you're all aware of most of them um, but definitely very very important for the student to understand a lot of this themselves and as early as possible so that they can take on elements of the responsibility so it doesn't always have to be a little bit of a battle um, or that they don't understand the need to do these things. I think when they understand more and more the need um, and it is illustrated in, a, let's say, a suitable way, then hopefully they can they can see the reward in that. Students that are highly functioning and have learning differences can vary. Obviously, either in a spectrum, they can either be highly diligent and want to exceed in education or they can go the opposite way and be a little bit disinterested. But for the most the highly engaged and students that really want to kind of go above and beyond and constantly achieve and achieve, these are usually the first things to go. And um, so their self-care and they're looking after themselves are usually the things that that drop quite quickly. And um, so it's really important to notice those flags at home or in a school environment as best as possible and try and help a student prevent those pitfalls, let's say, as they move through. On a studying basis, then, obviously, you know, ahead of exams or ahead of exam environments, you know, flashcards, either colours or not colours. We find some students like the coloured format, but with lines. So lines are really important um, in this sense. Coloured cards without any lines are usually quite difficult unless they're used for a picture basis. And um, so picture diagrams fine, but if they're used for wording, you really need to have the lines because obviously most students can't write in a straight line. Um, regardless of even whether they have a learning difference or not, they might find that difficult. Um, again, the mind map paints colours and um, coloured pages can vary as well. We, we've spoken about this before. Um, some students like them, some want to stick to, to kind of traditional colours, um, but generally speaking can be quite effective, but used sparingly is the most important piece. We have um, some teenage girls and, you know, gone off to do the leaving search and then half the page might be purples and yellows and and you know then nothing stands out so it's really important that colors if they're used in a highlighting function that it's used for the purpose of one or two pieces of information to stand out as a core basis instead of everything colored or everything you know highlighted and illuminating folders and organizational notes um, obviously this is a, a big chunk of work um, we used many years ago work with some schools directly and we would have gone and helped students um, on a physical basis try and manage all of these things and with lockers and um, we do that a little bit differently now so I do an introduction to secondary school course um, online for students it usually takes place in August um, for a few hours where we try and help them manage let's say their their subject choices and all of their inter integration into secondary school and um, usually that's where it needs to start to be honest people will find it harder and harder to um, integrate that both as a student and as a parent as they get a little bit older. So ideally starting in first year with some element of, you know, systemized and systematic processes um, for organizing all the books and all the notes um, will be really useful. So they stay in the same place. Are they color coded? Do they have folders? Do they have pockets? Do they have Anything at all, labels, not labels, you know, what is the system that works best for the student and ideally asking them about it again might not be always open and receptive um, to some bits of things. So judging your timing might be important, um, but usually they'll know best what will suit them. So trying to catch them on a good day might be useful. Um, also, there's loads of um, examples to maybe show them. So if they're not sure, then maybe Google some things and be like, OK, should we try this or this might be useful or some student did this and um, showing them examples of things that they can see. OK, I'm, I wouldn't like that or I'd like this so they can figure out their mindset on things. Organizing notes on a computer. So this piece is really, really vital for students that maybe typing their notes or using online books. Um, as we know, on a computer and a desktop or an iPad or a laptop or whatever functioning system the student is using, it can be very useful and great and it goes into the bag and then, and then that's it. 
Um, but trying to find and rectify things can be a really, really big challenge. Um, ideally, obviously, students that are doing constant homework on a laptop um, or, you know, prepping for exams, environments, really important that they have a set filing system online, like they would as a physical filing system in a cabinet or in a folder, because um, they will really need to look back on the exam notes or the exam papers that they may even done as far back as first year. So obviously all first to third year syllabus and fourth, depending on the school, and um, to sixth year syllabus is needed. You know, so lots of students um, would keep all of the notes, especially if they did the module from first to sixth year. They'll keep six years worth of work, which is quite a lot um, really. So it's really important that there is a system generated for that. Are they done by a date? Are they done by a content? Usually our best method is we get every student to put them all into separate folders and then everything is labelled based upon content because lots of students in three years time won't remember what date they did a piece of homework on, but they might remember, OK, I need this piece of a mountain question or this piece of an algebra question or anything like that. So it's usually done in tandem between dates and content. Um, 40 to well 30 to 45 minutes um for sitting without any movement or generally speaking a little bit of movement in between is often best there's an awful lot of studies on this um, over the last number of years and um, regardless of even the pandemic in general and um, it's really important to ease the staticness particularly in the study environment so what we find most obviously particularly for students that are a little bit are older um, or even in a college basis or anything like that that you know can get stuck into a piece of work and get frustrated and find things difficult and then they eventually try and crack it but they might have already been sitting there for two hours so it's really important to have some element of movement and that doesn't always have to be you know physically moving away from the space so obviously the integration of the moving desks may not be always possible at home you know um the exercise balls for students to sit on any element that can kind of change their i suppose physical posture and uh, will be really really useful to help kind of ease that constant position of looking at a computer or looking at a book and just consistently sitting there for quite a lot of time unfortunately um limiting distractions again this is i obviously you know how long is piece of string and um, can be very difficult in in this current climate with so much going on and so much technological devices where best possible it's integrated then with focused work and focused time so it's you know 20 minutes of you know focus let's get this done and then a few minutes off or a few minutes of the distraction piece it helps then retain that element of concentration versus downtime and um, but obviously distractions vary from student to student so if they're all in on something the distraction level obviously can be massively limited and decreased um, fidget toys I won't majorly go into obviously a full <laughs> detailed outline of what this is but I'm sure most are familiar um, or even have them at home um, our best use for fidget toys though in a study environment is quite sparingly really because often anything that's kind of there as a distraction can be used as a deterrent from understanding bits of the material so fidget toys can be useful in a homework setting, can be useful in a school setting if approved by the school and by the teacher. But when they're understanding and trying to learn off material, throwing a ball or, you know, squeezing anything can help create bits of that distraction. So it is, it, again, you sparingly, ideally in, in that type of situation is best. Um, helping them maintain focus. The music without any lyrics is a really big one that's come up for us um, over the last few years and particularly with our older students, you know, phones and such a wide variety of music. And um, it's really, really important that there's no lyrics attached to a song if a student is studying. So what happens is they're understanding, trying to understand what's on the page or on the computer, and then they're trying to listen probably subconsciously to the words that are in the song. Um, so then everything gets a little bit muddled. So what has actually happened with some studies is the students have mixed some lyrics of the song with the content that they were supposed to learn and come up with their whole new version of a syllabus. Um, so it's really important that if students like element of rhythm or beat or find the quietness quite daunting, um, having some elements of playlists without any lyrics is, is vital. And loads can be seen on Spotify and YouTube and loads them for free. Um, but again, no, no kind of words attached to it. 
brain training games and tools. So any puzzle oriented stuff um, as again, used as a little bit of a break time or a downtime aspect or again, used on an ongoing basis can be very useful to help students with their ongoing concentration. And then board games, obviously, and puzzles kind of goes without saying. Um, okay, so the next section I'm gonna kind of split into a little bit before, then kind of just before the exams and then just after the exams. So it, this will kind of vary if some people are planning ahead a lot, this might not be applicable at the moment. Um, but then if some are doing, let's say exams in a few weeks, <laughs> this might be very useful. So it depends, I suppose, on where you're coming at with this, but hopefully um, to some element, it might be useful now or else down the road. Um, so generally, a few weeks before the exam, we want to gather all as much information as possible, either given by the teacher, by past exam paper questions. This can be, again, for even entry into secondary school um, exams. So it doesn't have to be, you know, big state exams or anything like that. This prep can be done for all types of exams. And once we gather the information, it's about breaking it down into its simplest form as possible. So it is obviously a technique to learn and, and kind of revise, I suppose, in a sense. And practice does make perfect with this as to trying to figure out right what actually is the information we need to learn versus all the additional information. Because obviously, you know, a whole book in a school syllabus is not everything that needs to be learned in that. It's the key points that need to be understood and then given in an exam environment. So it's really important that the student starts to gather all the information. So they have all their sheets, their notes, their online notes, whatever format they have that will be applicable in the test and then start breaking it down into an easier format for them to learn. That then mixes in between using mind maps, using study plans um, and then trying to integrate a bit of a plan for, OK, I've like three weeks or I have a month or I have a bit longer. How do I break all the subjects into equal enough proportions, depending upon the level of understanding? while then maintaining overall well-being. So that plan and structure will be vital at that stage. The unfortunate thing at this stage is obviously if it's a few weeks out, there may still obviously be an illustration of homework. So that may still be as a kind of const constant topic. Some teachers will vary with that. So some will ease off homework, expecting students to study, but the others won't, will give more homework because they think, okay, students might be studying as much as they would like them to. Um, so it can be a challenging period. Well, okay. Apologies, I'll just put everybody back on mute. Um, so it can be a challenging time between balancing time-wise with homework and then balancing time-wise with actually studying and trying to understand bits of the material. Often we do a little bit of a trade-off. So when I'm working with students directly, and we try and see, okay, how vital is this piece of homework at the moment? And, um, you know, can we do a little bit of it? And can we see, can it be pushed out a few days? Or, you know, how essential is it needs to be done now? And is it effective? So is, is this content, the type of questions that we will get in an exam environment, is this going to be useful? Now, we have a little bit of a quiz question, guys, if everybody wants to take a second or two. So either on our Instagram or our Facebook page, um, if anybody wants to look up, I know loads of people probably have, uh, you know, found bits of it already before tonight's talk. Um, but it's just at Blossom for Life um, on both of them. Um, so hopefully it should be quite easy for everybody to find. Um, on the Instagram, it should be on the story version. And on our Facebook page, it'll actually be a post. So it's quite easy to get at. Um, when anybody has found it, if they want to shout ahead um, as to what the question is or what they think the answer is, that would be great. Now we did just look at it, but I'm just making sure I do my own little pop quiz. <laughs> to, see, to see what it is and making sense to everybody. I have the question here if you want me to read it out Emma. great yeah perfect Amy thanks yeah. a million if listening to music when you are studying should it be with or without lyrics great yeah very good and what I know we just looked at it so from your side Amy what do you think or what do you think is best in your personal opinion as well from your background would you prefer to listen 
to music with lyrics if you were trying to learn something off or what best suits you? Yeah, no, I I think it totally makes sense that it would, you would be subconsciously taking in those words as well as the words you're trying to take in. Like it would be very overwhelming. Yeah, it definitely can have a mix, you know, it can be a little bit stressful for some and others, yeah. you know, you'll find that students will try and convince you that, oh no, this is fine, I can definitely do this because obviously they enjoy it and um, I want to do it. But look, I am, um, yeah, generally speaking, it, it isn't the most um, effective and, and beneficial method really um okay so we'll move forward from there hope that makes sense for everybody and um, if anybody has any questions on that or, or wants to find out a little bit more and um, feel free to to link in um and we can kind of address them then at that stage so we'll move on to our kind of a week before the exam so usually kind of like say six to seven days depending upon you know how far a week thinks um, it is sometimes if it's Monday or Tuesday your exam might be the following Thursday or Friday so we won't kind of get into the splitting here so that but you know generally a week seven to ten days before an exam environment so it's quite fastly approaching um, either one or multiple exams is important to note as well so you may be going into let's say an exam block or it may just be one you know random exam or one big enough exam I suppose at this stage, it's really important that you've completed again the other stage. So we've gathered all the information. We have broken it down into its simplest form either using mind maps or visual representation or bullet points or, or whatever form that's in. And then this is now about revising as much of the material as possible in a concrete way. So it's about, OK, we well, have all my chapters here on the broken down version of you know, biology or the circulatory system or anything like that. And now I need to try and figure out how best do I learn the core concept? Okay, so you've broken down all of the chapter, all the exam paper questions, all of the notes that you've gathered. And now it's into the like basic, basic facts as to what you need to learn and how it applies in an exam environment. Again, while trying to maintain bits of the well-being and the balance. At this stage, students get a little bit overwhelmed because they've often done a lot of work with trying to break down all the information um, and that can often be a little bit the easier part. So that's kind of more gathering and organizing and a lot of students find that, you know, a little bit enjoyable. It's definitely time intensive and draining, but it's not sitting down trying to understand all the material and trying to read it off a page. So they can find kind of step one relatively OK. This step then is obviously right. Well, we've done all that stuff and we've done all the kind of busyness. Now we actually need to kind of focus and we need to do the concentration piece. And um, usually if there's multiple exams, so splitting them is really, really useful and really important. So if it's um, on a weekend or an evening or, you know, let's say during past Easter, um, if they're prepping for the exams in a few weeks, it's about dividing the time best as possible. So if like say 20 minutes, half an hour of one subject, bit of a break and then into a next subject um, or kind of doubling back as well as is a useful approach. What we often suggest is really important ahead of any of these types of sessions and um, as students sit down and tries to outline, okay, what is this session and what they want to get from it and what does it look like for them? So they want to obviously understand something in the easiest and best ways possible. I want to be wasting loads of time coming in and out or getting distracted by things. Um, and they want to be able to then, you know, illustrate it um, in an exam situation and context. By the time they finish, they should review back over, let's say those goals or objectives for the study session, see what has been missed or see what has been met. And then that will determine whether they need to review the content or they're okay and happy to move forward onto the next chapters and onto the next sequence. Often useful as well at that stage, depending on how late in the evening, this could be, we don't suggest students working late in the night time, but may often be needed is trying to illustrate the information to somebody else. So taking five or 10 minutes to explain, okay, these are bits of the chapters and literally explain to someone that, you know, pretending obviously that they've no knowledge, even if they might, as basic a format as possible, but having the other person just kind of sit there, really, it's not an interactive or engaging session. Um, it's not a kind of conversation approach in a sense, because that can distract the student. It's very much the student kind of offloading, basically, listen, these are all the things that I've learned just you kind of sit down there and just listen to me for a few minutes 
Um, obviously at the end when they're done finished explaining the content it is useful for the person's listening obviously to say okay I get where that is or I don't understand that and then that kind of forces the student to kind of reevaluate. okay do I understand it if I can't explain it to somebody else so one of the key pieces of uh, ways of studying really is trying to understand it so that you can communicate it to somebody else first orally so in a, a dialect conversation and then in a written format obviously which is needed in an exam environment then the dreaded week of the exams so let's say a few days before um or kind of leading in from the weekend into the start start of the week is usually only going over essential information so we've gathered our whatever 20 or 30 chapters we've condensed all them down into our notes and now we're only going over the essential pieces that we either have kind of gaps in, we're not really sure of, or we're going over what we think will definitely possibly be on the paper. Obviously, there's no guarantees. Um, but, you know, kind of having a little bit of a guide on that. Reviewing some elements of questions generally doesn't have to be in a written format. So again, students that are sitting more state exams or Bay Area exams, it could often be, you know, reading back over for five, 10 minutes and then saying in the head, OK, I'll answer that bit. I'll answer that like that. And they don't have to write them all out because obviously writing out exam paper questions at this stage is too late. So by any means, between kind of 10 to seven days ahead of an exam, no student really should be writing out um, lots of exam paper questions because it's tiring both on their hand or on their typing skills um, and very little, I suppose, benefit and effectiveness at that stage. Um, the managing stress levels piece obviously drastically comes in at this stage. It gets a little bit more daunting. It becomes a little bit more real, especially if students have been prepping for exams for a while or a few years. So it's really important, again, to try and, you know, bring things back down and help a student, again, link back in with that previous slide about their well-being and, and looking after themselves. The night before. So the night before, obviously, is a really vital time because it's obviously just before they're trying to go in and sit in an exam environment, either by themselves in their own separate centre or in, you know, a room classroom environment or in with other students. That's the core piece where it's kind of like, right, what's done is done kind of approach. Um, you know, it, it, there should really be no new content um, done at that stage because it can overwhelm a student. Um, often people, you know, think do stuff the night before. Um, there's some studies um, that some students that might help them a little bit. Obviously, if it isn't major exams or um, if, you know, it kind of gets thrown at them and they weren't aware of something. But generally speaking, um, the night before is to be kind of come a little bit more solid um, and work on the confidence piece of, OK, I know what I know now. And hopefully um, this is enough that, you know, will get me the results that I feel I'm comfortable with or that I would want to get. A written sleep routine or a nighttime routine is really important at this stage. And most students that we would work with um, would find sleeping patterns um, for an test environment, either large or small, quite challenging. So it's really important to have that unwind piece as best as possible. Um, limited discussions about exams should take place the night before. Um, there's limited kind of, let's say, um, constant reminding um, at home as well is really important. The student is well aware they have a test tomorrow, so they don't need to be constantly reminded about it. Um, it just will obviously increase their stress levels and increase their anxiety levels. Some element of movement here can be useful, but not strenuous movement. Um, so it's really important that if you know a student is very highly active and um, that they engage in some element of movement prior to let's say the, the day of the exam, but you know, by no means they should be going out and doing two hours exercise or anything very cardio-based. Um, it should be kind of light enough movement so that they're again muscles in their body isn't tired waking up the day of an exam and they want to go back to sleep um so it's it's that balancing act there of movement but not not over movement the morning of the exam environment again it's kind of I suppose a little bit similar to the day before and um, even though stress levels can often be a little bit higher or they could actually be more eased the morning of the exam depending upon how the how comfortable the student feels are going into doing the test and um, it again becomes a little bit more surreal that they have to do it now and this is kind of it that all the time they put into it and um, 
what I would suggest, depending on if it's a morning or an afternoon test, again, depending upon, you know, what type of test environment somebody's going into, really important to just have a few minutes for the student by themselves. So either at home or they're going into the place or, you know, before they go into the exam centre. So they're not constantly, you know, surrounded and asking questions either at home by parents or friends and then the examiners or then the readers, you know, there's always constantly people in an exam environment. It's really important that they have a little bit of space to themselves to clarify their thoughts. Um, the time piece, again, is really important here. Um, often students might get a little bit overwhelmed and might actually lose track of time a little bit. Um, they might find that things take a little bit longer or else they'll do them too quickly and they're rushed. So we often find the students will, you know, rush the whole way through it and they forget, you know, their pencil case or they, you know, forget something that they needed for an exam environment because they're in panic mode or else they're the opposite. And it takes them like 45 minutes longer than what they needed to 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 do the thing. So it's, it's that balance, again, of, of trying to instill onto the student the concept of time and managing time and, you know, trying to ease as much um, pressure and stress as possible. So ideally arriving to an exam environment, if it's a physical exam, which I'm sure most of them are now, um, it's really important to kind of be set up in that space. With students, obviously, with different ways of learning, um, their exam environments are different. Um, I'm not sure if some might have been through the process already, but um, in a secondary school environment, if students have access to additional exam accommodations, they may be in a separate space and they may have somebody calling out the content. They may not. You know, it kind of obviously varies depending upon the student requirements, um, but that will all lead to a time basis. So obviously, if a student is going into another room, they've taken out of somewhere else, they need to get a laptop, you know, they may need to sort out all of those things. Sometimes they say, oh, you know, if they're a few minutes delayed, let's say from the teacher standpoint or a lecturer standpoint, they allow the time on, they should. And lots of students, again, with a learning difference may get access to additional time, but it's important that, you know, the student is prepped and ready as best as possible when the exam starts so that they can then kind of fight their corner if they say, well, you know, you didn't have the charger for five minutes and they need an extra few minutes, then that should all be allowed um, instead of the student, you know, in overwhelm as well at that stage. And um, the start of the exam, writing down the brief main concepts before anybody might forget them. Um, so what we do with students um, ahead of exam environment, so taking one topic at a time, we take four maybe five, sometimes kind of only four topics that they find the most challenging. And their aim is that once they close up all their books, they're at the test and um, they you know, are sitting at their desk, they get handed the paper straight away. They haven't even looked at the questions. They write down their four or five key points that they're kind of convinced they're going to forget quite quickly. Um, so that they're there regardless. So they haven't even looked at the paper. They don't even know if they're on the paper or not but they've written down their few things, if it's either acronyms or if it's examples or anything at all, quotes, if they're learning off Shakespeare for junior sort or leaving search, and um, they write down their two or three, maybe four um, essential things that they think, okay, God, I'm going to forget this as I go through the exam. And then they read through the paper and, and do all of those stages then at that time. Just after the exam, apologies, some of this is a little bit small, so I'll call bits of it out to you. Um, the main element here is trying to forget about what you've written. So particularly for state exams and um, for lots of students, there's an awful lot of comparison. And um, even for entry exams anymore, and um, we find a lot of students will come out a little bit overwhelmed and they got 25 in this particular answer and you only got minus four. There's so much comparison going on um, and so much comparing of things that it can be very daunting and then students already try and calculate okay well I got this wrong and I got this so what many marks I'm coming out with and it's all fictitious and um, it's really important that if a student leaves they're comfortable in well I tried my best I did what I could and um, hopefully it went somewhat in their favor if it didn't hopefully it's not the end of the world and um, but going over things and ruminating on content can be extremely draining particularly obviously unfortunately if a student a has to go into a next exam that day or even the day after you know so it, it can take up an awful lot of mental energy and time um in a in a quite intensive environment 
We'll briefly speak about the DARE method um, just in case anybody has any interest in that or um, people from a leaving cert basis. Um, so DARE is um, an access to universities and third level education route for students that have different learning abilities and um, dyslexia, dysgraphia, autism um, anything across the board really. Um, and what this does is this helps students obviously get into a system or get into a course on a reduced points basis. Um, now, depending upon what age um, the students are um, and children and parents and, and, and whatever else, um, this will probably drastically evolve over the next few years anyway. So it's important to note that unfortunately these systems are constantly changing, which is probably a good thing as well. But this may not be the same if a student's not doing a test maybe for another three or four years or anything like that that might be a very different process. But as it stands currently, um, what generally happens is obviously students have an education or a psychologist report and some element of obviously additional support and accommodations from the school. There's an online then let's say platform where students will register some of their details. Usually this is done in conjunction with a guidance counsellor or let's say a head of disability support in the school environment. So they have to approve, you know, some bits of the application process. It's fairly straightforward as it stands at the moment. Um, it's generally kind of letting an online some form of an application. And um, the main piece with this is kind of let's say a personal testimonial. And um, there used to not be a word count attached to that. I think there is at the moment from doing it with one or two students in the last few weeks. Um, but that again could evolve in the next few years, so it might not be anymore. And um, what sways lots of the marking basis from my experience is that personal testimonial piece. So as level of in-depth um, that that personal piece can be, the more chances really a student has of illustrating their case to, to somebody else. Lots of reports and lots of documentation can look the same um, from people that are reviewing the application. So that personal aspect is really um, vital, I suppose, really to, to the DARE process. There's often a lot of speculation as to how many points can be given. Um, this actually isn't definitive, so there's no set you know, if you have this, you get 30 points. And um, if you have this, you know, there's no handbook, unfortunately, and there's no rule book, um, again, which is probably a very good thing. Um, there's a lot of, let's say, talk about this, particularly for students in fifth and sixth year, and that, oh, I can't go into that because I won't get that many points given to me by dear. That's probably not actually true. Um, if a student is, you know, having a different difficulty um, and then has a lot of the documentation and writing a good personal essay, do the best they can. Obviously, then in a leaving certain environment, they have a very good chance of receiving quite a substantial amount of points and um, that they may need for a course. Unfortunately, it's unlikely to get, you know, hundreds of points and that's, you know, not obviously majorly applicable, um, but the, the scope varies. So it can be anywhere from limited points if only a student needs four or five, all the way up to quite a substantial amount if a student needs that. What happens is it's done based upon spaces also in the course and they do a sum element very briefly it's not kind of scientifically done but obviously based upon the, the subjects that the students has chosen based upon some element of marks they're saying okay will the student be somewhat okay possibly to go in and do this course so let's say a student maybe they got you know two or three hundred points you know if they're applying to do medicine that might be a little bit of a jump for them or that might be quite challenging so that might not be the best fit for them and um, so they might give them their second option or their third option so that element comes into consideration to where they're applying to and what concrete information they have about the student to date with that and um, but from my personal experience and from my experience with dealing with students that have been through this process um, it can be you know a complete life changer you know so really really important um, piece of of helping students um, progress in that direction if they want to um, Okay, so some additional support options before we go through and, and speak about if anybody has any questions. Um, we have an online program um, about how to help dyslexics 
I call it dyslexics because I like it as a kind of a title, but it generally is kind of a one stop shop for students with, with learning differences or just want to understand and excel a little bit more. Some of what we spoke about today is looked at a little bit more in depth. So again, the mind map methods and study approaches um, and mainly from a homework basis. So how do we get homework done more effectively? Ideally, in less time as possible, we create a cutoff time about 30 to 40 minutes for homework for hopefully all students. And um, so in that program, we discuss how to kind of help a student with that. And um, if they're older, then it's a teenager. Obviously, they can watch the program and hopefully implement it themselves. As you mentioned, we do elements of individual support and um, some element of group. And obviously, as well, we do um, some element of, of parent work and teacher work. Um, as I mentioned earlier, guys, we do have the booklet, so I'll just put this in here again in the chat, um, just in case anybody didn't get that earlier. I know a few have joined in late, um, and I will unshare my screen, and people can feel free if, I, if people have any questions um, or want to come on about anything, um, by your head, and we can go through them from there. That's brilliant, Diana. Thank you so much. Um, oh my God, it, it's so much, isn't it, to take in? And <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of information. Apologies, I hope I didn't overwhelm people. Um, no, so it's yeah, it's a lot, you know. So it's important to take things in chunks to um, not take everything all on board um, at the one time. You know, kind of reflect upon things and see how things can be implemented. Um, thanks, Caroline. That's great. You're very kind for your comments. Um, I know a few have joined and a few have dropped off, so um, we might have a little bit of discrepancy um, with, with questions. But again, and look, if people have questions afterwards, feel free. Most of you probably have my email address. Um, thanks, Bobby. You're very good. Um, you know, if anybody wants any further tips or suggestions or wants something more specific, obviously, to, you know, an exam environment, that, that's fine, too. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Jonah. No bother at all. Listen, lovely to have you all on. Um, I hope some bits of it again anyway was helpful, and hopefully see you all in the near future when <laughs> you cross paths again. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. No, thank you so much. That was so useful. No um, bother. I I'm about to get loads of tips there now. I'm going out to like get all the flashcards.